Hi, Fia. Hi, Ashley. Have you ever wondered how we might get from A to B in the future? Maybe we'll trade in our bicycles and hail helicopters like cabs. Or even magnetically float through tunnels at close to the speed of sand. In today's episode, we'll flash forward to look at mobility in the city of tomorrow. Over the last hundred years or so, no one has invented a major new mode of transport. In fact, here in Oxford, people were riding on their bikes almost as much back then as they do today. But whether you travel on two wheels or four, commuting can be a real drag. It's no wonder we complain about it. Navigating blocked and congested roads, waiting for packed and delayed trains, again and again on a loop. Luckily, that could be about to become a hyperloop. Coming up. We'll be zooming through tubes in floating pods and looking into the hype around Hyperloop. We'll also be jumping into state-of-the-art helicopters and pacing the streets of Gothenburg, where city planning is one step ahead. I was lucky enough to get the lowdown on future planning from Professor Malcolm McCulloch here at the University of Oxford. But first of all, let's get our figures and our facts straight. Today, 55% of the world's population live in urban areas, but by 2050, this is expected to increase to 68%. Robo-taxis are expected to take off rapidly after 2025, with 80% of people using them where available. As a result, car ownership should drop dramatically. By 2030, a quarter of passenger miles travelled on America's roads is expected to be in shared, self-driving electric vehicles reducing the number of cars on city streets by 60%, emissions by 80% and road accidents by 90%. How would you like to ditch your slow train and instead levitate straight to your destination in record time? In downtown LA, a revolution in mobility is making the seemingly impossible possible. Virgin Hyperloop One is designed to be an energy efficient pod that will travel from origin to destination at speeds of up to 1,100 kilometers an hour, over or underground, on demand. Its inventors see it as one of the most innovative new major modes of transport in 100 years. Once passengers board the Hyperloop, it accelerates via electric propulsion through a low-pressure tube. The vehicle floats above the track using magnetic levitation and glides at airline speeds for long distances due to ultra-low aerodynamic drag. It's fully autonomous and enclosed, so the hope is that this will eliminate operator error and avoid adverse weather conditions. It's also clean, in so much that there are no direct carbon emissions. When we look at the technology we're developing, when we look at the progress we've made, when we look at the fact that we've built a, a proof of concept already, I think we're going to change people's lives. I think we're going to improve the lives of people around the world. It's not just going to be for people that have a lot of wealth or in wealthy areas. We're going to dramatically change how people live. We're going to increase opportunities for jobs. We're going to change relationships. We're going to change their expectations uh, of how commerce is conducted. So when we really think about it at Virgin Hyperloop One, we have a unique opportunity to change the world. People have been dreaming about new forms of high-speed travel, including in a vacuum, for more than a century. Now, thanks to Hyperloop technology, that dream is about to become a reality. The Virgin Hyperloop One team started by combining existing technologies, linear electric motors, maglev, vacuum pumps, and built on a basic design to create a revolutionary mode of transport. So we started this company in a garage in Los Angeles in November of 2014, and the goal was to create the fifth mode of transportation. What we wanted to do was completely revolutionize how you thought about getting somewhere till you got there. So from the app experience, integrating with the last mile, to something that doesn't have turbulence, it goes where you want to, when you want to, for a price that you can afford, and you're not stopping at other destinations along the way, and ultimately, you get your time back, which is what we're trying to give to everyone. So how will it feel to step onto a Hyperloop system? Will we levitate from one end of the country in the blink of an eye? Not quite. It'll take 35 minutes from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. And its engineers say there'll be no turbulence, no wind in your hair. You'll accelerate and decelerate gently, just like riding a passenger plane or stepping into a lift. And from the outside, 
All you'll hear is a loud whoosh, due to the fact that the travel pod isn't touching anything. In May 2017, Hyperloop One was the first company in the world to test a full-scale Hyperloop. To describe my feelings, I only have to look at the faces of the engineers as that test proved successful, as the vehicle levitated and moved down the track, uh, an, an immense sense of pride and accomplishment in doing something that the world had never seen before. It's not just good news for passengers. It's also good news for freight. Virgin Hyperloop One will deliver high priority on-demand goods, such as fresh food, medical supplies and electronics at the speed of flight, making same-day delivery and efficient supply chains for businesses entirely possible. It will truly transform commerce, decrease the inventories invested in supply chain, and, and be part of what is becoming a world based on an on-demand economy. So next time you're chugging along on a slow train, just think, in only a couple of decades, you may well be levitating through a tunnel at mind-blowing speed in a revolutionary new mode of transport. Malcolm McCulloch is Associate Professor in Engineering Science and Group Leader of the Energy and Power Group here at the University of Oxford. As well as researching the domestic energy sector, user-centric demand site management technologies and behaviour change, he's at the forefront of developing powertrains for innovative electric vehicles. Malcolm, thank you so much for having us here at Oxford University. Now firstly, tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do here. So I'm an engineer and I've been looking in the last 20 years or so in sustainable energy. I've been looking at the role of uh, transport and the way it's changing and also the way energy systems are evolving. Malcolm, firstly tell me what are the key technologies that will revolutionise mobility in the city of tomorrow? Well, there are going to be three new technologies that we're going to need in the, in the near term, the mid term and the long term. Mm -hmm. In the near term it's going to be cheaper and more compact uh, batteries for electric vehicles. In the medium term it's going to be autonomous driving and making sure that works to a acceptable level. Mm -hmm. And in the long term it's going to be looking to say what are the alternative fuel choices for long distance travelling. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting ones is going to be ammonia, which is basically a better form of carrying hydrogen. What are the key challenges behind these new kinds of technology? So in battery technology, it's more about saying how do we make things compact and very cost effective. And that's mainly about how do we scale that up. And that's happening. On uh, autonomous vehicles, it's all about saying how do we get those algorithms to be even better than they are now and to be a lot more safer. And again, that's on its route to, to being viable in the near future. I think the real interesting challenge comes through looking to say what are the alternative fuels and in ammonia particularly it's saying how do we produce ammonia from green energy sources mm -hmm. and there's some really exciting work that's going on at the moment to saying how can we use renewable energy to actually produce ammonia but the really nice thing about ammonia is it's actually used in a multi-billion pound industry which is for fertilizer so there's a lot of work and effort in developing a green source of ammonia and I think that's going to be the winner in the next decade in terms of, uh, of long distance transport fields. Tell me, how do you think innovation like the Hyperloop can help climate change? So what that technology does is addresses the challenge on how do we go do long distances at high speed. And it's mainly from point to point travel. And the advantage is that the Hyperloop one allows us to do that high speed on ground, which means that we've got access to renewable energy sources to actually undertake that mobility option, which we can't easily do by doing air travel. But interestingly, about 15 years ago, I set a challenge to my students to say, how do you do London to New York on zero carbon? Mm -hmm. And they looked at actually developing a concrete version of the Hyperloop over that distance and they found it was actually feasible and they found that the carbon payback period on that was about five or six years. Mm -hmm. So it is possible mm -hmm. but it's a the technology enabled us to do that is still going to be decades away. But who knows in 2030, 2040 what we might be doing. When I'm stuck in traffic, I often wish I could just fly over it all direct to my destination. Wishful thinking? Maybe not anymore. In Germany, there's an inventive team looking to make it happen.
The Volocopter is a fully electric aerial mobility solution. The inventor's vision is that it will connect vital hubs such as airports with city centres, and flights can take off every minute and be available on demand. The Volocopter is intended to add a new mode of transport that will help us alleviate current congestion levels. Um, certainly, this is a transport in the air, and I don't expect to, you know, 100% of the ground transport to vanish and go up into the third dimension, but certainly a large part of it on certain routes. Um, since its inception, the Volocopter has been flying all electric, so we intend to make it as sustainable as possible. The developers say the system will be similar to current ground-based ride-sharing apps. Simply order a Volocopter via your smartphone and one will be assigned within minutes. Then, they say, all you have to do is sit back and enjoy the bird's eye view. The Volocopter is an entirely novel type of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. By its DNA, it's a drone, so you can fly it you know, remotely controlled, it can fly all by itself, or you can put a pilot in and have them you know, operate it via the joystick. And all in all, it's an extremely safe, sustainable, and very quiet vehicle. So the inventors hope that anyone and everyone can just jump in and fly, whenever and wherever they fancy. But how are they ensuring it's safe? Any individual critical component can fail, and the Volocopter is you know, prone to compensate for that. It goes so far that when we were walking onto the uh, airfield with the certifier, we were able to show him failure scenarios. So for example, he could say, okay, now turn off you know, propeller two and nine. Can I see battery six failing? Can I see flight control number two you know, uh, providing erroneous uh, sensor data, for example? and we were able to demonstrate in full flight how the vehicle fully compensated for all of these uh, scenarios. It sets a new benchmark where carbon emissions are concerned, as fuel is replaced by electricity. In addition, maintenance, repair and overhaul time should be reduced, as the system avoids complex mechanical components. So when we talk about the operational costs of the Volocopter, maintenance, repair, overhaul, MRO as we say, um, are a, a primary cost driver in, the, in today's helicopter operations. In a Volocopter, we have a very different um, outset, which is none of our um, individual components is absolutely safety critical. So we can reduce uh, the level of maintenance required um, significantly, one. Secondly, all of our components are very well accessible and have extremely low uh, wear and tear over time, so we expect in general, the MRO costs would be dramatically lower than uh, with traditional helicopters today. In December 2017, Brian Krasanich, former CEO of Intel Corporation, test drove the Volocopter for the first time. So we are testing the Volocopter regularly uh, on our test field here in Brusov. So it's uh, pretty much, you know, every day uh, flying. We expect to see a number of uh, demonstrations in relevant uh, environments and cities uh, in uh, 2019. Um, nevertheless, demonstrations, and uh, we expect to see first commercial operations somewhere between three to five years, hopefully on the lower end of that timeline. So it might be just a matter of years until we all have access to our very own private Volocopter with a simple swipe of our smartphone. It looks like the sky's the limit. Malcolm, how do we make all these new revolutionary transport systems interoperable? Well, the key is to make it really easy for people to move from one mode to another mode. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is make sure that it's co-located. So when we come off our plane, for instance, we can just go a few steps and there's our Volocopter ready for us to be able to take us to the final distance. And if we're really smart, we have the same ticket to enable us to do the complete end-to-end -end journey. Tell me, how realistic is it that the air will become the new public transport highway? In one sense, we already use the air a lot for long distance travel. Mm. If you're looking at intra-city travel, then I think there is a possibility that it might become more viable, especially as uh, the density of batteries increases and we have high powered motors, it allows these technologies to become more feasible. What the price point is going to be and whether we can get the re regulatory environment in place, that's going to be the challenge. So we could see a time where we're using volocopters like a taxi service to get to work? That is a possibility. The question is, is it going to be at the right price point and are we going to get the regulatory framework in place? How can we make sure that green transport solutions are accessed by everyone? Well, the issue is that we have to make the service uh, affordable, fast and equitable for everybody. Mm -hmm. 
And the interesting thing is that as batteries are being produced more and more, we're getting to much smarter in the way that we make them, so that we're finding that the costs are really coming down. And that means that these technologies are now becoming much more accessible to a wider range of people. Malcolm, thank you so much for that. Stay with me, I've got some more questions for you. But first, thought you knew everything there is to know about mobility in the city of tomorrow? Well, here's one common misconception. You thought you knew? Think again. Myth. Vehicle sharing could provide environmentally friendly transport to everyone in the world. Fact. In order to take off globally, vehicle sharing requires a critical population mass and still has a series of challenges to overcome. Car sharing needs to overcome serious competition from other modes of transport, such as affordable taxi services that are easily summoned on smartphones. Rates need to be irresistibly attractive. For electric and hydrogen car sharing to grow successfully, city councils have to step up and support it with adequate infrastructures like public charges and dedicated parking, which make the cars straightforward to use. If car sharing services can bring all these factors together, there's nothing to stop the two billion cars expected to hit the roads by 2040 being shared, cleaning up the cities of tomorrow. The invention of automated vehicles is racing forward at the speed of Formula One, but we also need a magic formula to fit everything onto our city streets. City planners in Sweden are the first in the world to put firm plans in place for the future. City planners plan for the future. So how do they see autonomous vehicles becoming part of the way you get around? And how do they make sure they take to the streets smoothly, especially in historic cities? As city planners, we realize that around the world there is a huge focus on developing the new technology for autonomous vehicles. But as yet there has not been significant collaboration between city planners and car manufacturers. In order for autonomous vehicles to work well, we absolutely have to work together. In order to map out the future of the city's streets, the planners are using the same world-class rendering 3D models used by Hollywood filmmakers to experiment and try out different ideas. It's so one project that was very successful using this virtual model. It's a project concerning a cable car over Göta Elv, the river in Gothenburg. Then we use, we use the virtual model as a background and then we have the cable car, the new cable car, the planned cable car, and we can use this model to show the citizens how the cable car should look like from different angles, from the ground, from different apartments, from windows. And you can actually make a tour on the gondola over the river. The vision is that automated vehicles will flow smoothly around the city centre, reducing congestion and CO2 emissions, and that traffic lights, road signs and car parks will all become retro relics of the past, freeing up valuable space. We think the benefits for the city will be safer and more secure transportation. The flow of traffic will be more even, smooth and efficient. And it could also free up space for green areas, playgrounds, meeting spaces, wider sidewalks and bike lanes. And large parking areas that require a lot of space can be used in a better way. It sounds idyllic. But can pedestrians remain safe crossing roads dominated by robots? The safety for both pedestrians and passengers is important. And comprehensive testing of the technology is required. We will continue to have traffic regulations for vehicles and pedestrians. And from an urban perspective, it is desirable that separation and restrictions of movements are no worse than today with fences, main roads and similar barriers. City planners are already test driving their plans and in 2017, 100 self-driving Volvo cars took to the streets of Gothenburg. This was the biggest experiment of its kind in the history of the automated vehicle. It's still early days and we are currently making studies and do workshops together with the industry, academia 
and test the interaction between autonomous vehicles and city planning. So we, we are working on it. 100 cars operating automatically around Gothenburg city centre. It may seem like a scene straight out of a sci-fi film, but soon this is set to become a reality. If these vehicles are used right, it will not just make the individual travel options more attractive, but also mass transit. And this is one way to make the sustainability goals a reality. Word on the street is that other major cities are already hot on the heels of Gothenburg, so it might not be long before incorporating automated vehicles into city plans will be as automatic as the vehicles themselves. What does the future hold for electric cars? Well, I think we're at an interesting point. Where I think we're at a tipping point for electric vehicles, where in the next two or three years, you're going to see a large amount of battery production coming online, which is going to make them really much cheaper. How can new technology, such as automated vehicles, fit into old cities? Well, I think they actually can fit in quite well. Uh, automatic vehicles are really good at perceiving their surroundings, yeah. and actually there are a lot of clues for them to pick up in older cities, so looking at buildings and the like that. The, the real challenge is going to be to say how do they interact with, motor, uh, with motorcycles, with bicycles and with pedestrians, yeah. because quite often we use human cues when we interact with it, and that's where their challenge at the moment is, is how do they pick up on those small micro cues and then make their challenges. But in terms of old cities, it's absolutely fine. Say I'm the mayor of a city, how would you advise me to prioritise over the next 10 years to meet Paris climate change agreement goals and to achieve zero emission cities? So the first point that I would start with is to say make your public transport really high quality and green it up. So one of the interesting things we found in Oxford is as soon as they put in hybrid electric vehicles uh, for their buses, mm -hmm. Actually, we found that the passengers really preferred them because they were much smoother and actually provided a much more enjoyable ride. Secondly, I would start to look at considering zero emission zones, but make them really small to start off with so people get used to the idea that one day they might have to go to a zero emissions vehicle. So uh, bikes, pedestrians and electric vehicles only? Correct. And, and so, for instance, in Oxford, we're starting with a small section of the high street which is turning to a zero emissions zone in the next uh, year or two. And that then enables people to get ready to say, actually, what we now need to do when I make a decision for my next vehicle, I actually want to consider either a hybrid or an electric vehicle. And that gentle nudge transforms the way we think about what mobility should look like. And actually, it's much more pleasant because we don't have the noxious fumes anymore. It's much quieter and actually often a lot more fun. What's your ideal vision for a transport in the city of tomorrow? Well, for the city of tomorrow, I would love to see a city that's redesigned that's much more greener, where actually my preferred mode of transport is walking and actually enjoying moving from one place to the other. And potentially, if I need to move longer distances, is to go in a quiet, clean transport, such as either electric bus or uh, electric vehicles. But to me, it's about saying, how do we improve our overall quality of life and not just be stuck to the old ways of doing things, but to envisage something that's fun, healthy, and uh, a lot more exciting. Malcolm, thank you so much for having us today. It's been a pleasure. So after a century waiting for a major new mode of transport to arrive, inventors now are making up for lost time. And pretty soon we'll be cutting emissions and journey times, travelling in automated vehicles gliding around perfectly planned streets. The future of mobility in the city of tomorrow looks bright. Next time we'll look at mobility of energy. How important is it for our energy to be mobile? Can we source what we need locally? We check out developments in everything from battery to tanks and outer space, keeping us all powered up. And if you have any questions for our expert on the next episode of Sustainable Energy, you can get them to us in all the usual ways at CNBC Energy using the hashtags Ask SE and Sustainable Energy. But until next time, keep thinking green. Goodbye. Goodbye.